This is like a, is a really hard thing to do uh, a talk in, especially if you know me. Um, never met a microphone I didn't like. So WebDriver. WebDriver is the new API for the, the driving a browser as produced by the Selenium project. It is a draft W3C standard. You should not be writing code using the remote control API. You should now all be writing code using WebDriver. WebDriver is just an API. That's it, nothing more. Just like requests, just like random, just like sys. It's just an API. Um, and so you write your code with that in mind, and you'll have a much happier time doing it. Um, important thing to note, WebDriver will not test your code for you. You, the human driving the keyboard, need to think about what you want to do uh, in order to uh, test your application. It will drive the browser merrily for you, uh, but there's no magic, I'm using WebDriver, now my application will be fully tested. Um, though if you give me lots and lots of money, I'll tell your boss that you can do that. Um, that's a consultant in me speaking. Um, so WebDriver, there's, uh, you can get really confusing with names really fast. There's actually two variants of WebDriver. There's WebDriver, which has no qualifier on it. And then there's Remote WebDriver. And Remote WebDriver, um, you run the script on this machine and it plays somewhere else because there's a server running. Um, developers tend to gravitate to the regular web driver because, oh, I don't need this extra overhead of running a server and it's really cool. Um, but I, I would recommend that you ignore the regular web driver and just go straight to remote web driver because eventually you're going to need it. And then you have to change your code and it's kind of, kind of annoying. Um, especially if you're going to run a grid or run things up in the cloud, uh, you need the remote web driver instance. Um, two, let's see, three things that I want to cover today, other than that little spin at the beginning. Um, if you're writing web driver code, you need to be writing page objects. Uh, page objects are object-oriented representations of a page or a portion of a page. You can tell I've said that a couple times. Um, so let's say that we're looking at the PyCon site because that would look like that would be a reasonable site to demo. Um, the home page would look suspiciously like this, or it did at 6.30 in the morning when I wrote the scripts. Um, page objects have standard formats. At the top, we have all our locators all nicely grouped together in whatever structure you choose. I like dictionaries for this. Um, you can use it by ID and look for things in, in many different ways. ID, CSS selectors, XPath are the three that most people use. If you're writing your web applications yourself, put IDs on anything that you care about interacting with. It'll make your life so much easier. Barring that, go down to CSS selectors. Use those as sort of your default structural selector, unless you need access to the text of the element or you need to go back up, down, and sideways the tree, um, which you have to do sometimes in more nefarious applications. Um, let's see, and the, uh, you know, I, there's various ways that you do that this page objects just, just happens to be buying. I like to override gets and sets in order to use them in my script so I can do things like the home page speaker blurb title equals speak. Um, otherwise, you have to get elements and all sorts of things. It just looks nicer in the script if you use the uh, in the actual script if you use the descriptor protocol to override your gets and sets. Uh, let's see. In my page objects, I tend to always have an open method if I can. Well, I always have an open method except when I don't. Um, if I can navigate directly to the page, I use an open, and the stage is just sort of moved. I'll just stay very still. Um, so the, Py, the PyCon site, we can go to any individual page, but sometimes you have like a login and then you, there's all sorts of session stuff that you have to deal with. And so an open method does make sense. Synchronization is where you will spend 80 to 90% of your time inside WebDriver because the, the computer that's running the script will move a hell of a lot faster than your web application. Um, so there's this little WebDriver wait that takes a lambda and will hang out until Either the timeout happens, or in this case, it's looking for an element if it appears. Um, again, synchronization, you will rue the day that you started web automation because of synchronization. 
And then I've just got, for those people at the front-ish of the room, you can see the, the go-to schedule meeting, which is going to actually well, go like this and move it up. Uh, click a link and then create an instance of the schedule page object and wait until it's synchronized. So running this, uh, I use PyTest as my runner, um, just because. Um, let's see, I need to put a tag on this appropriately. PyTest.mark.atom. Seems like a reasonable tag. Uh, Adam scripts. And depending on the status of my phone's wireless, which is going to be sketchy, maybe. Do, 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 do. Flip, 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 flip. All very exciting. Look at the web, web browser opening a web page, because we've never seen that before. Um, and we transfer all the things. And hey, look at that. It passed. That one was always passing. It's the other one that wasn't passing 20 minutes ago. So that's page objects. There's tons of information about page objects. And now you all know the magic word to look into Google. There's uh, stuff on my website, uh, element34.ca on it. Um, Mozilla uses page objects for all their web automation. So they've got examples in their GitHub. Um, look at the pattern. Figure out the way that it works best for you. And uh, decrease your maintenance woes. So page objects are out of the way. The next thing that you're going to need to know about going forward is the, what's called the JavaScript executor, because hooray HTML5. Um, HTML5 brings a whole new level of pain uh, to your web automation. Uh, we're all happy that Flash has died of horrible flaming death, uh, only to be replaced by Canvas, which is an even blacker black box that has no standards, so there's not an even way that we can monkey patch uh, methods to get at things in it. Uh, so yeah, we'll fix the canvas problem through um, uh, teaching developers how to write automatable canvas apps. Um, but you'll have to use the JavaScript executor, so you'll just connect to your browser and run some blob of JavaScript that the developer made available to you inside the canvas app. Um, and because Nobody really has produced an open source Canvas app that is easy to automate, and I had handy. The second part is really the key part. Um, let's just fire some JavaScript, which I put on the schedule page. So if you look at the HTML of the schedule page for each section, there is actually this little hidden, um, well, it's a fake table. I don't know what's going on. It's just there. It's called fake. You can't see it. Um, WebDriver tries to emulate the user, so you cannot interact with, uh, like, you, it can find an element that's hidden, but you can't get the text of an element that's hidden because a user who's being a normal user and not hacking around with Firebug can't get at it. So just return an empty text. Um, so you can sort of say, screw you, WebDriver, I'm going to do what I want it anyways, and just run the JavaScript that's going to get it for you. Um, so in this case, we've got a locator. It's Tuesday Fake Table Venue, and it's this crazy XPath. Um, not fun to figure out prior to coffee, but that's what you do. Um, we're going to find an element. We're going to pass, then pass that element into a blob of JavaScript, and we're going to return whatever the text content is of the element that was found by that nasty XPath. And in theory, let's say we'll just move this tag around. Uh, well, if you're whatever test runner you're using, make use of its tagging system to do dynamic test suites. You should never be creating a class called test suite class and adding your tests. In. Um, that's how you inject dependencies between your tests, which really hinders your ability to parallelize things. Um, and it's just going to load up the page and it's blank screen and be all great fun. What are we doing? We got 10 minutes, one more thing to cover. And it should, in theory, when it finishes loading, be novel and go to the schedule page. And then it 
ran some JavaScript, which is really boring to try and show on a, a browser. Um, so yes, the JavaScript executor is just in the web, in the Python web driver. Um, I have to pay attention to Knox because she's going to tackle me if I go over time. It'll be great video, but it's going to suck. Um, it's just JavaScript, which means it is a really big, monstrous hammer. Um, the, at the Selenium conference, not this year, but last year, uh, two guys from Mozilla automated a little helicopter game, and it was going around through the cavern, all based upon feedback that the developer was prov providing through JavaScript. So it was just pulling JavaScript and then interacting with it. It's pretty cool. There's a video on YouTube for it. Um, <clears throat> but it's just execute script. There's, a, there's also an execute async that I haven't quite figured out why you would want to do something asynchronously when you're trying to automate it, and synchronization's already a pain. So let's just start doing things with no possibilities of synchronization. Um, so yes, JavaScript executor, it's going to unfortunately be with us a long time because of Canvas. Oh yes, and the other thing we, we're going to need for JavaScript executor is all those stupid JavaScript widgets that look like HTML elements to the user, but are really a stylized, uh, unordered list with all sorts of JavaScript events on it. Um, it's basically just designer porn, I think, rather than actually <laughs> functionality. And it makes our job automating it so, so incredibly painful. Um, but if you build by the hour, it's, I suppose it's not that bad. Um, <laughs> All right, so the third thing we want to care about is um, the ja the, what's called the uh, browser mob proxy. So this joke works a lot better in the California. Anybody here work at Facebook? No? I, it's, you know, when there is people in the audience at Facebook, it gets really fun. Um, so the automation is slow. You know, as soon as you light up a browser, it's slow. So if you can get away with not using a browser, don't use a browser. Um, but if you are going to load up a browser, you might as well remove, or you, you might as well make it as fast as possible, your application as fast as possible to render. So the first way to improve the speed of your website, get, the, get rid of Facebook integration. You will go from two and a half minutes page loading to like 20 seconds of page loading. Um, and again, um, the second way to improve the speed of your application is deintegrate Twitter. Uh, that'll take you from 20 seconds to 15 seconds. Um, and then remove analytics, spyware, scumware, trackingware. You know, where is the mouse? Um, <laughs> what sort of nasty things can I inject into their, their, their session? Um, get rid of all of that. That is not what you're testing. You are testing the functionality of the application. Um, and all that other stuff, leave it in for production, but when in your testing environment, get rid of it. Now, ideally, you would work with the developers, or if you are the developer, you use feature switches to just say, in this environment, turn it off, and it just doesn't appear. But if you are um, the quiet, the QA, or you know, the test engineer that doesn't want to talk to those much vaunted developers, or the project manager says, no, um, you can be um, a little aggressive and just say, screw you, I'm getting rid of you. And so here's our Selenium server, uh, which actually in this demo we're not going to use. Um, Patrick Lightbody, uh, developer on the West Coast, uh, he's now at New Relic. Um, had a startup called BrowserMob. They run performance uh, load testing in the cloud, but they wrote a proxy to be able to you know, produce things like the HTTP archive of your requests. Um, and so the Selenium community has sort of glommed onto the BrowserMob proxy as the scriptable proxy that we use in our, in our scripts. How many times can I use scripts in one sentence? Um, and one of the awesome things about the BrowserMob proxy is it's got the blacklist. So that means we can, in our scripts, for the people at the back, that's probably a little better, you can say, Google Analytics, screw you, go away. Um, or star.facebook.com, go away. star.twitter.com, go away. 
um, and it's right in your scripts, and it doesn't affect the actual application stack. I used to say use the host file hack, where you just route everything to 127001. Um, but I always forgot to unremove things. <laughs> so I'd be like, ah, oh, Facebook's down. I, no, I haven't seen that in like a really long time. And then I'll like hop on Twitter, Facebook's down, look at that. And like, yeah, it's, it's there. And it's like, oh, that's because I'm an idiot. Um, so um, one of the things that uh, I recommend is you don't use 200 for your um, response code. So basically what the browser mob proxy does is intercept any request to this URL and replaces it with whatever code you have. Um, don't use 200 because then you can't go through your log file to say, well, well was there a 200 request? Well, there really should be. Um, make up one, 309 is not used for, you know, one document I saw said 307 was reserved for future use. So it's not supposed to be, but then according to Wikipedia this morning, it's used for something. So make up a number or one that's unlikely to be in your application because then you can um, see how many there were. Um, in this case, I'm making a hard file for a descriptive purpose. And we got that as blacklist. That blacklist again, oh so exciting, lights up a browser. Um, and then it's going to print out this huge swath of JSON to the file to the console. Um, you can do things like Go to the page, get the HAR file, um, check for 404s. Your application really shouldn't be throwing 404s. Um, and, oh, because I told it not to. Yes. If I remember my command line switches, things work better. Uh, PyTest by default says you don't need output unless it fails. Um, so dash s is like suppress the suppression, which is this weird double negative that the Europeans created. Um, got like two and a half minutes. Come on, website load. Dead air. Big JSON of all the requests. Um, kind of shocks me how many testers I talk to that don't actually understand how a web page works. Oh, that's not what I want. I didn't want clean and that clear. Oh. I'm almost out of time. Trust me, in there, there's a 309. Um, and, you know, because apparently K and F are so close on the keyboard, I can't figure out which ones to hit. Uh, everyone looks at the keyboard and realizes they're not close together. Um, so, yes, that's a, that's a browser mob proxy. I recommend people run all your stuff through a proxy, blacklist where you need to. Um, the browser mob proxy can do things like traffic shaping and, and other things, but I use it just for blacklisting and for getting HAR files to introspect things. And with that, I've got one minute left. Oh, two minutes left. Um, that's a demo that it will be on my GitHub in the next day or so. I'll make sure the PyCon organizers have that. It's just Adam Goucher, all one word. Um, yeah, no slides, just code. That's WebDriver. Uh, page objects are your friend, Java Executor is going to be a necessary evil, and run everything through a proxy. Minute and 35 seconds for questions. Can, like, if you're still stuck dealing with Flex Flash clients, can you still test them through WebDriver? If you are, yes, if you are using uh, WebDriver, or if you're using Flash and Flex, can you use it with WebDriver? Yes, the project you want to look at is FlexPilot. It's a Swift file that loads in the bootstrap, does a whole bunch of magic that I have no idea what it does, uh, but allows you to reach in and uh, deal with things. But that's only if you have control of the Swift file. If you're using a third-party component that you're just plugging JSON in or something, then you're out of luck. And come talk to me, and I can show you how to do that. You, it's, if it's um, just your, if it's in a browser, you can do it generally. So, one minute. These are long minutes. Anyone? 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 What are you recommending for using the browser but without having X installed? Uh, there is, you can use XVFB, uh, and there's a Pi virtual buffer, I think, is the Pi virtual frame buffer is the package that does a nice little wrapper around it, and so you can run it on a virtual head. 
So you still need the X libraries and stuff, but if it's got no monitor attached, then you can do that, and you can run up to it's seven or eight, eight browser instances on a machine before you start getting into port conflicts. But if, if you are in that situation, that, that is a solved problem. Oh, she's got to stop. All right, we're done. <laughs>